Now, what precisely did you discover at Semipalatinsk? Well, I have here a pictorial rendition that glosses over some top secret information that I am not privileged to disclose to the public of what the Soviets have actually been doing at a number of places, including Semipalatinsk. What the Soviets have invented is the use of a nuclear device to generate a giant electrical pulse. And what they do is to explode a small device, nuclear, inside a steel sphere. And then through a series of magnets that are forced together quickly is to generate a giant electrical pulse. This energy is then stepped up to a much higher power level through these giant electrical transformers and then stored temporarily in a giant storage battery known as a capacitor. Here the energy is stored for small fractions of a second, then switched out and directed in the form of electrons, which are rapidly pulsed into a device known as an electron gun. And all of this injector or gun does is to generate a very high-powered stream of electrons many times a second of anywhere from 100 to 500 million electron volts per pulse. This is an extraordinary amount of energy and power. How can you relate that to, to what I would understand? How much power is that? Well, that's uh, as much power as comes out of a lightning bolt and certainly as much energy as a small kiloton weapon exploded may discharge. Now, the great trick here is to direct these electrons in a pulse stream into a device known as a collective accelerator. What comes out of this accelerator is a giant stream of protons with possibly as much as 10 to 100 billion billion electron volts per pulse. Well, I'm going to disclose to you for the first time publicly that the invention of this beam concept was a British invention shortly after World War II. It had the highest priority in the United Kingdom and those few privileged scientists who were involved were under the tightest restrictions from the Prime Minister himself that the United States was not to be told. How do you know this? I found this out uh, through a number of quiet investigations. And the men who advanced this concept in the United Kingdom failed in developing such a beam because they could not produce enough electrical power in all of England to generate such a beam. Now, the man who presumably was involved is now behind the Iron Curtain. And the Soviet work in high-energy beam weapons dates from the time that the British began to abandon their project because they ran out of electrical power. There wasn't enough energy. The Soviets invented a nuclear explosive generator as a device that could produce an, 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 that kind of power. And the man behind the project in the United Kingdom would have been Klaus Fuchs then? Well, I'm not going to uh, answer your question, but the speculation is, is, is a reasonable one to arrive at. In fact, it was atom spy Klaus Fuchs who betrayed the early research on beam weapons to the Russians. As the chief theoretician at Britain's new post-war atomic research laboratories at Howell, Fuchs was invited to work on a beam weapon which, even 30 years ago, was thought capable of detonating an atom bomb while carried inside an enemy aircraft. Fuchs was caught, sentenced to 14 years in prison, and after his release in 1959, went to live in East Germany. So this was an enormous Soviet invention, and it was tested more than 18 years ago by Andrei Sakharov, the man who's much now in the news. What would the weapon look like if it were developed? If you can produce this machine, this technology and test it, then there should be no problem to miniaturizing it. And if the Soviets deployed it in the field, I would guess it might look something like this. I think the Soviets could take some of their present ICBM silos, which the Soviets tell us contain no missiles, and they could put the electron gun in the bottom. They could put a sophisticated switching technology here, and they could place the collective accelerator that would generate the beam vertically all within the space of a silo. And as to the nuclear power generator, all the Soviets would have to do would be to put a steel sphere and a small explosive nuclear device at the bottom of an ICBM silo to generate the power on call. These magnetic mirrors would be used to bend and steer the beam. Now, 
assuming that a number of ICBMs coming to the Soviet Union were spotted by their long-range radars, their command center could then alert this site to prepare to fire to intercept the ICBMs incoming. What one man could then do is pull a switch and fire this nuclear device. It could generate several thousand pulses, and this beam generator could fire several thousand shots at these incoming missiles. What effect would that have on the missile? Assuming that you had 1,000 tons of dynamite explosive force here, this extraordinary process allows you to take that 1,000 tons of energy and power and put 100 tons of that 1,000 tons as blast directly against a warhead, which is enough power to eviscerate it. But simultaneously, this proton beam will get inside the molecular structure of this warhead and simply evaporate through hot x-rays, gamma pulse, neutron flux, these are all technical buzzwords, but in effect what you do is evaporate that warhead at the same time that you sock it with about 100 tons of blast. And that's what's so extraordinary about this energy transfer. So what are the implications of all that you've just said? Well, they're awesome, and they're very simple. Simply told, if the Soviets perfect this device, and they may not, but every indication is that they will, is what they could do in one fell swoop is totally neutralize the U.S. ICBM intercontinental missile deterrent. Let me put it to you even more simply. Imagine two men in a house or in a barn. One has come with a gun to threaten the life of the other and to take his possessions. And the owner of the house takes out his gun and he proceeds to defend himself and they both draw off and aim at each other, but one of them is wearing an invisible suit, a flak protection suit, and the fellow coming in to aggress him and seize his possessions can fire all day long, and none of the bullets are going to penetrate. That's precisely the significance of this extraordinary development. And to turn our back on this now means that within this decade, we would risk losing the entire basis of the free world's ability to prevent nuclear war.